Chapter 5, Constitutional Law, Part 2, presented by Kelly Herzig. I hope you took a break between listening to Part 1, which had a lot of information, and this Part 2, which will also have a lot of information. So far, we've covered federalism, separation of powers, checks and balances, judicial review, the supremacy clause, federal preemption, and the commerce clause. Even just federal preemption and the Commerce Clause is a lot of information, and then we added in the rest of those other topics as well. So what's left in Chapter 5 to look at? In Part 2, we will examine the Dormant Commerce Clause, the federal government's tax and spend authority, other constitutional restrictions on government, and we'll end with the Bill of Rights and other major constitutional amendments and their impact on business operations. Let's talk about the Dormant Commerce Clause. Laws enacted under Congress's Federal Commerce Clause authority can often conflict with a state's ability to regulate intrastate commerce, which as you know, is commerce solely within that state. Courts have attempted to resolve this conflict by distinguishing between regulations of commerce and regulations under a state's police power. Police power in a state is the ability to pass laws that protect the health, safety, and welfare of their citizens. For example, states often use police power to regulate the criminal law, building codes, zoning, sanitation, and the licensing of doctors and lawyers, anything that will protect and defend its citizens. The Dormant Commerce Clause is known as the restriction on state's authority to pass state laws that substantially affect interstate commerce. Basically, the states are given a lot of leeway under the police power to pass laws. But once again, when there is a conflict with in the Interstate Commerce and the Commerce Clause, federal law and the Commerce Clause wins. When evaluating laws passed by states that have the potential to impact interstate commerce, courts must balance the state's interest in protecting their citizens against the law's impact or effect on interstate commerce. Courts use a two-part test to evaluate whether a law impermissibly affects interstate commerce. One, is the law rationally related to a legitimate state interest? And two, if it is, does the regulatory burden imposed on interstate commerce outweigh the state's interest in enforcing the law? In addition to this test, courts often ask if there is an alternative, less drastic action available to attain the state's legitimate purpose. This just means that can the state pass a different law that will still protect its citizens without burdening interstate commerce? Once again, you often see courts put their thumb on the scale on the side of interstate commerce because of the supremacy clause. Let's examine Congress's taxing and spending powers. Article 1, Section 8 gives the legislative branch the authority to tax its citizens and to spend revenue to run the government. You might recognize Article 1, Section 8. It's also where the Commerce Clause is located. Taxes have to be consistent across the states. Federal taxes cannot be higher on citizens of one state than those of another. You might ultimately pay more taxes depending on where you live, but those are based on state taxes. For example, Kansas has an income tax, but states like Florida and Texas do not. So that's ultimately a difference in state taxes, not federal taxes. Federal taxes have to be the same across the board for everyone based on their income level. Congress also has the power of the purse, again, under Article 1, Section 8. That means it can pay U.S. debts, provide for the common defense, and promote general welfare. Congress has a lot of leeway in spending revenue. It is Congress that approves appropriations to fund the government and other federal services. While the president can propose a budget, how he wants to spend revenue, it is Congress that must pass the appropriations bill. They don't have to use the president's proposed budget. In fact, they can ignore it completely. 
Congress's power of the purse is another check on the executive branch. There are some other constitutional restrictions on government that I think are important to point out. One is the Privileges and Immunities Clause, located at Article 4, Section 2. This clause prohibits states from discriminating against out-of-state residents and within their borders when they engage in ordinary and essential activities without a substantial reason for doing so. States have to have a pretty good justification in treating in-state and out-of-state residents differently. States cannot prohibit non-residents from doing such things as selling or buying property, using a state's court system, or seeking employment. There are times when states are allowed to distinguish between in-state and out-of-state residents and treat them differently. An example of a permissible regulation under this clause would be permitting state universities to charge higher tuition to out-of-state residents because in-state residents pay taxes and that supports the university while non-residents do not pay taxes. That's why if you're an out-of-state student, you may pay higher tuition at WSU than someone who lives in Kansas. The Full Faith and Credit Clause, that's Article 4, Section 1. This clause requires states to honor and uphold contracts and public acts established in other states. Those things include another state's court order, wills and estates, marriages, divorces, adoption, and court judgments. This basically allows people to move from state to state without having to get remarried every time or suddenly having their 10-year marriage in one state not recognized in another state. I mean, think of the disaster that would be. It also helps people with court judgments. For example, if you get a judgment against someone in Kansas because they injured you in a car wreck and they have property in Missouri, you could take your judgment under the full faith and credit clause and go into court in Missouri, register that judgment, and then try to attach free property in Missouri to help pay for that judgment. Finally, the Contracts Clause in Article 1, Section 10. This prohibits states from passing laws that may unreasonably impair contract obligations. I do want to point out that the Contracts Clause only applies to the states and not the federal government. We're now going to turn our attention to key amendments that affect businesses. But before we do, I want to put this slide back up again. You've seen it before. It's the Bill of Rights. It's the rundown, a brief rundown of the first 10 amendments to the Constitution. I put this in here not because I'm going to retest on it again in this unit, but because I thought it would be helpful for you to have it here. Because most of the key constitutional amendments that affect business are located in the Bill of Rights, with the exception of the 14th Amendment, which was enacted after the Civil War. We'll be talking about that later on. Next, we will discuss the key constitutional amendments that affect business. The amendments to the Constitution that often affect businesses are the first, 4th, 5th, 9th, and 14th Amendments. All but the 14th Amendment passed after the Civil War are part of the Bill of Rights. We will begin with the First Amendment. The First Amendment protects freedom of religion, a free press, free speech, and the right to peacefully assemble to protest the government. The hardest part of understanding the First Amendment and what it protects, particularly with respect to free speech, is for students to understand and accept that offensive speech, which students might see as hate speech, is protected by the First Amendment. The First Amendment is wide and it is deep. Our founding fathers wanted to protect even unpopular speech or speech that most people would find offensive from government censorship. WSU is a regent school and is considered a state institution. In effect, WSU is a Kansas state agency, an arm of the Kansas state government. Now, one of my favorite quotes about the protection of free speech on college campuses comes from the American Civil Liberties Union. According to the ACLU, the First Amendment to the Constitution protects speech no matter how offensive its content. Restrictions on speech by public colleges and universities amounts to government censorship in violation of the Constitution. Such restrictions deprive students of their right to invite speech they wish to hear, debate speech with which they disagree, and protest speech they find bigoted or offensive. 
An open society depends on liberal education and the whole enterprise of liberal education is founded on the principle of free speech. Like all rights in this country, rights protected by the First Amendment are not absolute and the government does have the right to limit the such things as speech based on reasonable time, place, or manner restrictions, though they are interpreted narrowly by the courts. If the government tries to regulate the content of speech, what someone is saying, it is subject to the highest court scrutiny available, strict scrutiny. Content neutral restrictions like time, place, or manner restrictions, when you can say something, where you have to stand to say something, or perhaps in what manner you can convey your speech, these restrictions, if truly content neutral, are subject to what they call intermediate scrutiny. We'll talk about strict scrutiny and intermediate scrutiny in a later slide. The examples of time, place, or manner restrictions that have been upheld are funeral protest laws and laws restricting protests outside abortion clinics. Some speech is not protected by the First Amendment though these two are narrowly interpreted to avoid restrictions on speech that is merely unpopular. The first exception is called obscenity. Obscene speech is not protected by the First Amendment. It's hard to identify what obscenity really is. There's a famous quotation by Justice Potter in a case from 1964 at the Supreme Court, Jacobellus versus Ohio. And Justice Potter famously said, with respect to obscenity, I know it when I see it. Currently, there is a three-part test for obscenity that was first articulated in Miller versus California in 1973. It's based ultimately on community standards and not national standards. Obscenity is probably the hardest thing to identify even under the Miller test. So I don't expect you to be able to pick out what is obscene and what's not. You won't get a question like that. You might get a question on whether obscenity is an exception, but you won't get a question on what the three-part test is. The next exception is targeted harassment. Remember that hate speech is protected by the First Amendment, but when hate speech is so severe and pervasive and aimed at a specific person or group, it can become harassment, which is not protected. Basically, if hate speech crosses the line into targeted harassment or threats, or creates a pervasively hostile environment for vulnerable people, then that speech can be regulated. The next example is true threats. True threats are not protected by the First Amendment. True threats are actual real threats and not political hyperbole, sarcasm, irony, jokes, or vernacular in speech. And how many times have you heard someone say, I could just kill you? That's not an actual true threat. That's actually a statement of frustration or anger. And that statement would be protected by the First Amendment. It has to be a true threat to someone to actually be pro an exception to the First Amendment protections. The next exception is defamation. Defamation is the oral or written communication of a false statement about another that unjustly harms their reputation. And it usually constitutes a tort or a crime. We'll talk about defamation in more detail in later chapters. Now, there are two types of defamation slander, which refers to oral statements, and libel, which refers to written statements. Both of those statements have to be false. Fraud is also exceptions to the First Amendment. Fraud is the intentional deception to secure an unfair or unlawful gain or to deprive a victim of a legal right. Fraud is both a tort and a crime. Then there is fighting words. This is very narrow. I haven't seen a case in the last 50 years that have upheld a fighting words challenge. It applies only to intimidating speech directed at a specific individual in a face-to-face -face confrontation that is likely to provoke a violent reaction. It's basically getting in someone's face and invoking violence. It's very narrow. What you see more often is the incitement exception. 
in Brandenburg versus Ohio, the Supreme Court held that the government cannot punish inflammatory speech unless it is intentionally and effectively provokes a crowd to immediately, and I do mean immediately, carry out violent and unlawful action. This is a very high bar. And most of the time, even when you see the exception and you see the examples of the speech, it's usually protected under the First Amendment. The last major exception is speech integral to illegal or criminal conduct. That kind of speech is not protected. A good example of that is child pornography. Next, we will discuss a subset of speech protected by the First Amendment, political and commercial speech. What is political versus commercial speech? Why is that difference important to business people? Well, first of all, you must realize that in addition to protecting an individual person's free speech right, First Amendment rights apply to corporations, though courts do not treat all corporate speech the same. Political speech is speech that is used to support political candidates or referenda. Courts give political speech the highest levels of protection. A corporation is considered a legal person due to 14th Amendment jurisprudence. When we talk about the 14th Amendment later on in this lecture, we'll explain how corporations became considered a legal person for purposes of the First Amendment. Corporate political speech is protected to the same extent that individual political speech is. Corporations are treated like ordinary citizens with respect to political speech. There's a very important case from out of the Supreme Court from 2010. It's called Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission. In that case, the Supreme Court held that corporate political speech is a form of free speech protected by the First Amendment. Therefore, the government cannot restrict the amount corporations might seek to spend on campaign finance. Spending money, giving money to candidates is a form of free expression. On the other hand, commercial speech is speech that conveys information related to commercial transactions, like the sale of goods or services. The constitutionality of commercial speech is evaluated by a four-part test articulated in the Supreme Court case Central Hudson Gas and Electric Corporation versus the Public Service Commission of New York. I don't expect you in this case to know the four-part test, but I do expect you to know that there is a four-part test and what case it comes out of. In addition to discussing freedom of speech, when discussing the First Amendment, we also have to talk about freedom of religion. The First Amendment contains two provisions that protect the freedom of religion. The first is the Establishment Clause. The Establishment Clause prohibits the establishment of a national religion or the preference of one religion over another by the government. This is a classic prohibition against church and state being combined, meaning there must be a separation of church and state. The free exercise clause states that the government cannot make a law prohibiting the free exercise of religion. It's been a very interesting question in the law whether corporations, which are legal persons, have the right to the free exercise of religion. I think much of it depends on the type of corporation it is. In Burwell versus Hobby Lobby, decided by the U.S. Supreme Court in 2014, the Supreme Court held that Hobby Lobby, as a closely held for-profit corporation, was entitled to the free exercise of religion just as if they were an individual and was therefore not required to provide certain form of birth control mandated by the Affordable Care Act. Hobby Lobby is a closely held for-profit corporation owned by a very religious family, and they objected to providing contraceptives to their employees, at least certain types. The Supreme Court agreed that they were entitled to that objection based on their deeply held religious beliefs, and so they were allowed an exemption to the Affordable Care Act. That doesn't apply to 
for profit traded on the stock exchange corporations. There's been no case that says that for profit corporations have the right to the free exercise of religion such that they could object to things like providing birth control to their employees. So how does the free exercise of religion intersect with the workplace? Well, in private workplaces, free exercise of religion issues often arise under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibits employment discrimination. A good example of that is the Eloff case, E-L-A-U-F versus Abercrombie and Fitch, Supreme Court, 2015. Ms. Eloff wanted to work at Abercrombie and Fitch and she applied in Oklahoma City in 2008. She was wearing her headscarf and they refused to hire her. The Supreme Court, in part relying on freedom of religion, said that Abercrombie and Fitch discriminated against her in the basis of her employment because they refused to allow her to work wearing her headscarf. It restricted her ability to freely exercise her Islamic religion. I just want to discuss the free exercise clause versus the establishment clause. Both of those, of course, are in the First Amendment. There's always been a tension between the free exercise clause, which allows individuals to worship as they choose, and the establishment clause, which prohibits a state-approved religion. This conflict is often played out in the public employment arena, particularly in public school and university employment cases. Remember that these sections do not apply to private employers. They only apply to public employers like the state or the federal government. Generally, public officials cannot promote a particular faith over another. That violates the Establishments Clause. In the public school arena, the U.S. Supreme Court has consistently banned school-sponsored prayers in public schools due to the Establishment Clause. However, in 2022, there was an interesting case called Kennedy v. Bremington School District that the U.S. Supreme Court took up. And it directly dealt with the tension between an individual's right to free exercise of religion and free speech and a public employer's restrictions under the Establishment Clause. Now, Kennedy was a public school high school football coach whose contract was not renewed because he prayed on the 50-yard line in the middle of the field after games, often voluntarily joined by players in the public. Now, the school district was concerned that Kennedy's prayer sessions put pressure on his student athletes to join his prayers or risk not getting to play. It had the appearance of impropriety. It had the appearance that a state public school was promoting a religion, which would in fact violate the Establishment Clause. Basically, the case was about Kennedy's free exercise of his religion and how it conflicted with the state school district's Establishment Clause concern. Well, how'd the case turn out? Well, when it went to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court ruled in Kennedy's favor 6-3 and in support of his free speech and exercise of religion rights. Based on Kennedy, the current Supreme Court trend by the majority is to support free exercise and free speech concerns of individual employees over Establishment Clause restriction on public employers as long as the free exercise of religion does not create a situation where the state or other public employer is in fact sponsoring a specific religion, such as through required or coerced prayer. The case would have been different if Kennedy required his players to pray with him instead of just praying on his own and being voluntarily joined by his players. The justices in the minority, in the dissenting opinion, stated that the majority was chipping away at the wall between church and state that the Constitution's framers built. They would have sided with the school district as the lower court and the Ninth Circuit did. Now let's move on to the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment protects citizens from unreasonable searches and seizures. People have the right to be secure in their persons, in their homes, and their personal property. The Fourth Amendment prohibits the government from conducting unreasonable searches of individuals and using the fruits of those searches as evidence against them in court. Normally, to conduct a search, the government requires a search warrant signed by a judge that details the places to be searched and the property to be seized. It's not a free-for-all. They actually have to have probable cause and they have to show where they're going to search and what they're going to be seized and why, that is, why they have probable cause to do so. 
Now, there are exceptions to the search warrant requirement, such as exigent circumstances or items in plain sight. Now, in addition to protecting people in their homes, the Fourth Amendment also protects corporations as they are legal persons, and it protects corporations and their places of business. The police cannot just storm corporate headquarters. They have to have a search warrant. The Fourth Amendment only protects against unlawful searches and seizures by the government. So generally only public employers like state governments must contend with Fourth Amendment issues. Private employers are not constrained by the Fourth Amendment and employees generally have less privacy rights at work than they do at home. The key test is, does the employee have a reasonable expectation of privacy in the area or equipment to be searched? Courts have found that employees have really no reasonable expectation of privacy in places like desks, unlocked offices, company cars, company lockers, or on company computers or company email, and even text messages on company phones, as these are all owned by the company. Now it's different if it's a personal cell phone, totally different, but when the equipment is owned by the company, you have little to no expectation or right of privacy in those items and in those places. This is the end of chapter five, part two.